Good evening. We're here this evening with Tom Campbell, author of My Big Toe. Tom, pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you, Donna. Glad to be here. Tom, is virtual reality necessary for the evolution of consciousness? We have a larger consciousness system. Um, we have an individuated unit of consciousness, as you mentioned previously, and we have an avatar or this physical body. How does the process work? How does this transfer of, of consciousness work? Okay. Um, to answer your first question, yes. Virtual, virtual reality is necessary for the evolution of consciousness. Now, a virtual, a virtual reality like ours is not. A virtual reality like our universe is not necessary for the evolution of consciousness, but it's efficient for the evolution of consciousness. Okay, we evolve more effectively here, so it's an efficient learning lab. That's why it exists. But it's, that wouldn't be necessary for consciousness to evolve, to have a virtual reality like ours, because it was just plugging along, evolving, though very, very slowly. So it evolved virtual realities that were have a tighter rule set, which make them more physical, like our physical universe, and that made the process more efficient. But there are other kinds of virtual realities besides one with a very precise and, and tight rule set that make physical, quote unquote, uh, virtual realities. That is, virtual realities that seem physical, where there's so many, that there's enough rules about how things interact that you get feedback at many levels. See, we get feedback here in our five senses. We get feedback, you know, by sight, by hearing, by touch, by smell. Um, we see how things change as a function of time. All those senses as a function of time give us a lot of feedback. Whereas you can have a virtual reality, a very simple virtual reality, where the only rules are the protocols for communication or language, if you will. No, not a spoken language, but just a language, a way, to, a way to exchange data and then have that data understood and be, able to, and be able to understand data that comes to you. So that requires some rules. So what is a virtual reality? A virtual reality is a computed, that is information-based reality, a simulation, a calculational space with a rule set. That's what virtual reality is. The rules define how things interact, provides a consistent structure, a context for choice and experience. That's what a virtual reality does. Okay. Now, let's look at why virtual reality is necessary for consciousness evolution. We'll find it's even necessary for consciousness, period. Let's start back with the initial evolution of consciousness at like step one. Okay, and in my books I talked about an AUO, which was started consciousness with a very vague sense of this versus that. Yeah, AUO was... Um, Absolute unbounded oneness, which really doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just a, it's just a name, but that's the, we'll call that a, a proto consciousness, if you will, because it's not really consciousness the way we think of it and, and the way our consciousness is. So we call that maybe a primordial consciousness or proto consciousness. And all we have there is an awareness, and of course. One of our two assumptions is consciousness exists. And now we're giving a little background on how it came to exist. So we're starting with a, an awareness. We're assuming that. One, you know, one of our assumptions is that consciousness and awareness exists. And the other assumption is that evolution exists. That means a, a system capable of changing will change, will change to more efficiently suit its environment. Okay, so all it could tell was this from that, state one, state two, you know, I mean, this way or that way. 
Right? If it could do that, if it could be aware of its states, then think what that means. To begin with, that means time exists because you have a before and after. Now I'm at this, now I'm at that. Two states, that defines change. Change defines time. If you don't have time, you can't have change. So time is very fundamental, you see, to consciousness. Time is one of those, one of those ingredients that's required along with awareness to create consciousness. Okay, rather, and when I mean awareness, I mean this primordial, you know, proto-awareness that could just differentiate states. That creates time, change. Now, if there were no time, there would be no change. If there's no change, there's no growth, there's no evolution, there's nothing. There's no communications, there's no information, there's absolutely nothing if there isn't time, because there can't be any change. I shouldn't say nothing. Whatever there is stays and doesn't change. You might think of a, of a rock under the ground. You see, it's being timeless. Nothing changes in that rock. That rock just stays that rock, but that's not true. Given enough time, given enough millions of years, that rock will probably change some. You know, water will dissolve it. You know, the ground may shift a little bit. Uh, there may be changes in that rock, but that requires time. If that rock changes in a hundred million years, that requires time, a hundred million years. No time means no change. No change means no life. So in a, in a world with no time, there is also no life, no existence, no awareness, nothing. It's a dead thing. Okay, so we have an awareness that can distinguish this from that, which creates time. Not regular time, not tick-tock, tick-tock. We don't have regular time, but a sense of a vague primordial time, if you like. Regular time will be invented later as a technology, but now we just have time. So that's not really consciousness. That's potential consciousness, proto-consciousness. Now, it, uh, if it can do this and that, it can do this and that and this and that and this and that, right? It can do series of this and that's, and it might, uh, you know, it can do as many of those as it, as it wants. Let's say it evolves to do that. Okay, so we have our fundamental prototype of consciousness that's aware, can do different states. It can make, it can evolve to do more and more states more and more sequences of this and that, if you will. Well, it does that, and that's very limiting. It can make patterns. It can make patterns of, of this and that's. Like you could do a regular change between this and that. This, that, this, that. What comes next? This, right? Because that's the pattern. Well, pattern is a rule. The rule is, We'll switch between a this and a that, you know, every other time. That's a rule. So it begins making patterns, which is rules. Rules start to lower entropy because now a pattern is not random. A pattern has rules. Rules lower the entropy because now you have, you know, form. Things are starting to fall into patterns. It's not just random nothing. So we've got rules, the rules start to lower the entropy. Well, if this is an information system, you know, this and that is information, right? We're talking about one and a zero here, a binary, this and that. Well, in, once you have rules, you start to lower the entropy of the system. You're creating patterns, you're creating order, you're creating structure. Well, it wants to do more of that. Why? To survive. Because the whole thing will disappear if it returns to randomness. There are no patterns, it's just random bits. And it may take a very long time before this proto-consciousness even realized it could tell between this and that, and maybe a whole lot longer just to come up with a pattern. And then a patterns of patterns, and different kinds of patterns. You see, there's all sorts of patterns you can make out of ones and zeros. 
So, it had rules, but it was limited. And I'm sure it evolved with lots of rules and patterns and patterns, but it couldn't get past that point as far as lowering entropy goes, except to just maybe get more complex patterns or whatever. But that wasn't enough. What it needed to do was have find another way of more uh, interaction, you see, more uh, novelty, more ways that it could build more complexity, more, more patterns, more processes. Well, the way it did that was to divide part of itself and interact with itself. See, now it wasn't just one monolithic thing, it was a couple of monolithic things that could interact with each other and each with free will. Because if you didn't have free will, then the interaction wouldn't mean anything. See, it wouldn't be a meaningful interaction. You can talk to your little hand puppet all you like, but if it's all you, you know, it's not, a hand puppet doesn't have free will, you're never going to really get anywhere because there isn't any novelty. So it has to be something that can interact with you freely and do its own thing in its own way. Now that interaction is something that creates a whole lot more novelty and a lot more ways that you can cooperate to build things. Now there's two this and that's. Now you can get these this and that's and interleave them and build something more because you've, you know, more complex patterns because you have two weavers weaving rather than just one. And they can then interact with their weaving of this and that's to something more complex. More experiences. Yes, so more experiences are possible. Now your decision space goes up. There's more things you can do, more ways that you can interact. Well, then you do more of that. You create more of these subsets, individuated units of consciousness, you see. You make a whole lot of them so they can interact. That would be us. Now, <laughs> the thing that has to change here that's critical, talking about these, the free will and, and uh, uh, virtual realities, once you made that there was not just one but two, that only is helpful if those two can communicate, if those two can interact. Well, some sort of language, some sort of way of interacting has to start to evolve. Because otherwise you just have two things, and it's like two monolithic things. You have this thing that just does its thing, and that thing that just does that thing, but they can't interact. So that's not really lowering entropy much. Just having more things doing the same thing doesn't lower entropy. That's not novelty. That's not building and constructing and cooperation. So the two things, in order to lower their entropy even more, have to interact. If they interact, they need rules, protocols, that allow them to interact. Okay, so that was the first virtual reality. You see, it's a rule that provides context for the experience. So one, one entity could experience the other, but without the rules, there was no context. There was just two individual things. Once you have a rule set that allows them to interact, you have something bigger something more interesting, something with more potential, and something with lower entropy. That's called evolution. And things just naturally evolve toward lower entropy. That's the nature of evolution. Lower entropy means more structure, right? more information, more complexity. That's, the, that's lower entropy. Now, think about it, and you see that, the, that evolution plays the same games everywhere not just with consciousness, when, I, when our biology evolved, okay, when our biology evolved, we started with a cell, a single cell, unicelled things. Now we call unicelled things bacteria, or at least that's one of our names for them, is bacteria. It's a one-celled living thing. Okay, these bacteria were lots of different kinds, but each one was an island unto itself. Each one just did its own thing. Well, then these bacteria figured out a way to join together and cooperate, split. One would split into two. And now you had a two-celled thing, but it didn't help much if those two cells didn't work together, didn't cooperate, see, if there was no language between them. 
Now with cells, the language isn't a shared data like you know a consciousness would have, but it had to evolve, and these are probably biochemically and you know and structurally the way the the way the bacteria you know have structures and and so on to be able to interact. So they interact cooperatively, and then they split more and split more, and you have multi-celled things, and all the cells were cooperating. And then you had a specialization of cells where groups of cells had their own special tasks to do. You know, the eyes, the nose, the feet, the, you know, the digestion, you know, the, the motion, you know, they all had special things to do. So we had all these cells cooperating with each other and that builds something much more complex and much lower entropy. So this is the natural way of evolution. And just as biologists have to start with that first cell. They can't say where that first cell came from, but they can make a pretty good argument as to how it might have come about. Well, you had lots of inorganic elements and molecules, and you just happened to get the right kind of elements together, maybe a little energy from, you know, from a little electricity, from lighting or something, and it just happened by random to make an amino acid. You know, the things, all those things just joined together and now you had an amino acid. And then you had the right environment that that then turned into that first cell, which then multiplied into more and you know, that's where we pick up. But you have to start with that assumption of a first cell. And you can kind of rationally show how that could come about. It's kind of a random event that eventually takes place and when it does, it takes hold and goes. Okay, well, we're doing the same thing with consciousness. We start, we don't assume a first cell, we assume, okay, the first consciousness cell, if you like. And then we can go back and, and look at um, uh, emergent complexity, uh, a formal mathematics that shows how out of randomness, you know, out of chaos can come order and complexity. And it works the same way. You just some random process will put something together that works, which then can grow, can evolve. So that's the, you know, that's how that works. And we know that that can work because we have cellular automata that you can give very simple little rules to, not complex rules, just simple little rules to, and they will evolve. Some of them will move, you know, which means they replicate themselves a little bit further away. They keep replicating themselves and it gives them this appearance of moving. And uh, some of them, um, some of them will grow and, and then kind of reach a stasis and not move anymore. But there are some that keep right on changing and growing and evolving and, and getting complex and have no end. There's at least we found no end yet. They just keep, keep going. That's their nature because of their little rule set. So if you try millions of these things, you'll run across some that just keep going and evolving, and you'll run uh, into some that uh, have nifty rule sets. And it can be shown, actually Fred can show that with a very simple rule set, they could generate a cellular automata that had the properties of a general purpose computer. In other words, it did all the things that a computer can do. Well. If we are in a virtual reality that's computed, you can see how it might have had a very humble beginning in this proto-consciousness we're talking about, which came about just like the first cell from you know, randomness that caught hold into something that was, that was uh, able to become self-aware of this and that with a cellular automata that could compute, you see? so. Anyway, so that's kind of the hand-waving argument that kind of makes that make sense, like the hand-waving ar ar uh, argument over here in biology about the, you know, the inorganic matter forming a biological molecule like an amino acid. And like. So those are both kind of similar. So that gets us to the point now that we need a virtual reality for communication between these two things. And then there's multiples, there's more than two. There's lots of them around of these individuated units of consciousness interacting with each other. And the more of them you have, the more novelty, the more choices there are with, you know, among the whole. So the whole thing 
it can get more complex and more cooperative, just like the cells did. They got cooperative and they built things. So you can have that, that process going on, but it only happens because you have a virtual reality that allows them to interact. Simple virtual reality, just how do you communicate? How do you connect? How do you share information? All right, so now eventually all this evolves up to where it can compute a real complex virtual reality from some, some starting initial conditions and a rule set. Now this evolved, and it's not like they scratched their head and thought about it and came up with that. No doubt, this is evolution. No doubt it was tried billions of times with different rule sets and different initial conditions, and eventually they got something that sort of worked. And then that sort of worked kept evolving and kept being tweaked and kept being, well, this one was almost stable. Well, this one's a little more stable. That's the way our science works too. You know, you get something that seems to work and then you keep improving it. So it, our technology works that way and this technology works that way too because all technology works that way. So it evolved and after a time, it found this rule set that with these initial conditions produced a stable virtual reality that could serve as a schoolhouse for its self, for its individuated units of consciousness to interact more um, in more ways than just exchanging data. When you just exchange data, your interaction is like 10,000 people in a chat room with no rules. Well, that's better than nothing, but it's still not much traction in that interaction. There's no way to get feedback from how am I doing, you know, does it, you know, how am I affecting others, how are others affecting me, it's a real shallow kind of interaction. You go into this virtual reality where you have sight and smell and, and uh, taste and hearing and you have all these things interacting in this real sticky reality, then you've got, it's easy to see what you're doing, how you're affecting these other consciousness because they're right there. It's not like they can just blink out on you. You can just blink out of a big chat room, right? You can just disappear and then come back next time under a new name. You can't in this virtual reality. You're there. You've got your name. You've got your avatar. And you are now a, an accumulation of experience. You accumulate in this. And you can't just blink out. You can't just, you know, uh, reset. You can't do any of those things. You have to interact. You're in, a, you're in a game that requires your interaction. So now we have a, a, enough rules to provide a very tight context and a way to interpret interaction. And that's what this is. So your initial question was, is it necessary to have virtual reality for the evolution of consciousness? Is yes. Because the virtual reality can be as simple as communication protocols. That's the simplest of virtual realities. And without that virtual reality, there is no consciousness. Okay, so that's, that's kind of step one in this answer of how do we end up with our, how, how does consciousness connect with an avatar? Okay, that's step, that's like step one. Now, the next step is, okay, we have these individuated units of consciousness, and now they're conscious, and they're subsets of this larger consciousness system. All right, now we also get this virtual reality game that now we're capable of doing because we've evolved our consciousness to, you know, to what we would call conscious. From that proto-consciousness, kind of became consciousness, just like that one cell turned into an animal. You know, got multi-cell and actually turned into an animal. So we're having a similar kind of thing going over here. So how does that work? Well, that individuated unit of consciousness. Um, well, let, me, let me back up a little bit. I'm going to have to define terms. We have an individuated unit of consciousness, and we have a thing I call a free will awareness unit. Okay. Now, these are just functional definitions. Don't make these things into real things. These are metaphors. They're functional definitions. We, we have how consciousness functions. And the individuated unit of consciousness we'll call, it has the accumulation function. It accumulates experience and evolves from it. It makes choices, accumulates experience and evolves. This free will awareness unit 
is a piece of it. So we have an individual unit of consciousness, and it's going to take just a, a subset of itself from its being level, not from its intellect, just from its being level, and there will be, so here it is, and I take this amount of potential being, right? So it's got all the things it needs, it's got enough memory, it's got enough processing, it's got all the things it's going to need to be aware and conscious, but it doesn't have a VR. It doesn't have a virtual reality. It's just a piece set aside. There is no virtual reality. Well, if there is no virtual reality, it's not conscious. Remember we just said you need virtual reality for consciousness. It can't communicate. It has no, um, it has no history. It has no uh, experience. It's just a, a piece of consciousness, of proto-consciousness, of potential consciousness. It's not consciousness yet because there's no virtual reality. There's no history. There's, there's no, there's no memory. I mean, there's, there's memory, but it's like blank. You know, there's nothing on it. But what it does have is all of the, the um, quality, all of the basic, uh, what should we call it, essence of its parent, the IUOC. The IUOC has evolved up to this point. And this little piece of itself that comes out of its being level has that. It has the potential to be that. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be that, but it has the potential to be that. It's got what it takes to have that to do that. So now you take that free will awareness unit and you let it start experiencing. You, if you will, you attach it through a VR. You give it a VR of this physical reality, what I call PMR, physical matter reality. So now you say, okay, we'll plug you into this VR. Suddenly, it's got a data stream, and it's in the VR, okay? But it's immersed in that VR. You see, that's its job. The free will awareness unit is a totally immersed experience. Its only reality is that VR, because that's the only data stream it has. It has just this one data stream, and that's the data stream, like the data stream to your computer on World of Warcraft. You know, it has that one data stream, and... What is it? Well, it's an infant. It's probably a, you know, a four month into the, five months into the gestation infant who's hearing its first sounds and feeling its first motion. And it evolves to where it starts kicking, you know, the, its mom from the inside and things like that. So it has some awareness even then. And what is it learning? Well, it's starting from scratch. It doesn't have any of the baggage of its parent. Okay. It has only the potential of its parent. All the potential that this parent has put together up to this time, it has that. But it doesn't have any of the baggage. And a lot of people would say, yeah, but it needs memory. It needs all this, you know, it needs to be able to know where it came from and so on. It doesn't. All that is unnecessary. Let's say it did know. Let's say it did know the last several lifetimes. It doesn't even limit it to that. So let's say it did. What would it do? Well... It would start second guessing. It would be making its decisions from its intellect if it had intellectual information, and not just being level information. So if it had intellectual information, it would be saying, well, I remember last time I did this, I think I'll do something different. And you'd say, well, what's wrong with that? It's learning. No, that's all intellectual. It's acting. It's being, a, it has a, um, an image. It's acting. You don't want it to act. That just gets in the way. It has to interact at the being level. It has to be exactly who it is and does exactly the way it feels because that is expressing itself. And then it has to see, how does that play? What kind of feedback do you get from being real? Not what kind of feedback do you get by pretending to be something you're not, you see? So we don't want it to have an intellectual remem you know, memory from where it's come from, because that will just get in the way. That's why this, this free, will awareness unit, free will awareness unit gets old and has to be recycled, because eventually it paints itself in a corner with so many um, beliefs and so many constraints on itself. Because of those beliefs, it gets 
closed off and its growth rate slows way, way down because it's had this experience and now it second guesses everything. It doesn't really just react out of the, out of the now and what it is. It's got all these overlays of culture, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, how I should be, how I shouldn't be. It's got all of this and you don't want that new free will awareness unit to be burdened by all of that stuff. You're speaking of past lives, and this question yeah. comes up often. It seems, people say it seems such a waste to lose all of the sure. experience you've gained. No, it's, a, it's absolutely <laughs> necessary to lose it all at the intellectual level. You don't lose any of it at the being level. So the quality gain from all that experience, all the good decisions you made, all the love and caring that you, that you demonstrated, okay, that raises you up to a little higher you know, level of evolution, if you will. And that you retain, the potential for that, that's there. But what you don't retain is this intellect that remembers it because the intellect will get in your way. You know, you can't grow anywhere except at the being level. See, there's a difference between acting and being. With an intellect full of that information, you could act better. But it's not about acting better. It's about being better. And acting better just gets in the way because you act through your whole life and you even lose touch with who you are. You don't know who you are. You don't know what's at your being level. Your core is invisible to you because your whole life is nothing more than acting. You know, you're in a culture. The culture expects things of you. You act in certain ways to get along with your culture. You can't act outside of that constraint because you've just learned that you can't. You know, that's the culture constrains you to that. The culture says you can't act in these ways. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a set of constraints on you if it comes in with your intellect. What you need to come in with is just your being level. And you need to be authentic, interact with the world at the being level, and then grow up from there. So when you change, you're changing yourself. You're really a different person, not the same old person who's acting differently. You are differently. It's not that you say, I wanna help that little old lady across the street because I think it's a good thing to do. It's you just help her because it, it's what you do. Not because you think it's a good thing to do because you don't think at all. You just do because that's you. You see, there's a difference. So people would say, people who are used to acting their way through life like to have all that information because it would help them act the way they think they ought to be. What they don't understand is acting isn't valuable. Being is valuable. And if you had all this intellectual stuff passed on, you'd be just acting. And you'd, be, it's just, you'd inherit all the stuff that already backed you into a corner here. You weren't growing much because you'd done that, been there, knew everything, had, all the, had everything figured out as best you could, which wasn't very good at all. But here's, here's the way it was. You kind of get set in your ways, right? You get older, you get set in your ways. You, you don't really like new experiences. You don't really learn much. The old dog doesn't learn many new tricks. You kind of get down to the point where you're kind of dysfunctional as far as growing up because you've, you've kind of backed yourself into a corner with all, these, with all this intellectual stuff. Well, get rid of that. That's just junk. That's the baggage that you don't want to carry with you. You've already backed yourself in a corner. Why say, wow, I sure wish I could have all those you know, constraints that I had, you know, when I passed away last time, so I could not do very well this time too. That doesn't make any sense. You want to get rid of all that stuff, start over and be. And the people that feel inadequate to be, it's because they want, they're acting. And if they had more information, they could act better. You see, that's the, that's the feeling. Well, if I knew what the answers were, I could, I could, get a better grade on a test. Well, if you knew what the answers were, the test's meaningless. You see, if you come with, with the answers, then why even bother to take the test? The test doesn't mean anything. You're trying to cheat the test. 
by making a better grade than you deserve because you're getting the answers ahead, you see. That's not what we want to do. We want to take the test at the being level, interact with the world, get the feedback, and change at the being level. And if we let our intellect get in the way, all we do is act our way through it. We don't even know who we are on the inside, except every once in a while we have this, uh, this um, what do you call it, our, our unconscious jerks us around, gives us an emotion, you know, makes us cry or run or do whatever we do. We don't even know why we do that. It's just some thing inside of us that jerks us around. Well, that's because we really don't know who we are. That's why we have this secret unconscious that's outside of our consciousness. That's our, that's our being level in there, and we're not acquainted with it. That's what the, you know, the subconscious is. It's your being level, and you don't know why it's doing that. Why do you feel that way? Why do you suddenly break into tears when such and such a thing happens? Well, if you knew yourself, you'd know. You'd understand all that. You wouldn't have a subconscious. You'd just be conscious. None of it would be sub. You'd be aware of everything about you. you know? Understand who you are. So you see, we don't want that. So that's why. And the second thing is it's very impractical. How would you sort this knowledge such that it wouldn't be overwhelming? You had 10,000 lifetimes. Are you going to have all of those memories? All of the 10,000 lifetimes, all of the 50,000, 100,000 people that you were close to, that you loved, that loved you. Right. You know, every, all of those relationships, you're going to bring all of those along. That, of course, doesn't make any sense. And if you say, well, okay, I understand that's a problem. We'll just take the last two or three and bring them along. I could deal with that. That would be in your way. It would confuse you. It would get in the way of what you were doing. And it would prevent you from your optimal growth and growing up. So we have this. So where were we? Okay, we have this, this, uh, this virtual reality now. And a individuated unit of consciousness takes a part of itself, detaches it from any virtual reality, any data stream. A virtual reality is defined by a data stream to an individual. Every individual has their own personal data stream. And no two data streams are alike, just as no two people are alike, because no two people have the same experience base. So this data, th this piece is not conscious. This little subset is not conscious until it gets a data stream. And once it gets attached to the PMR, physical matter reality data stream, the data stream that defines this, this physical universe virtual reality, then it is conscious because now it has a data stream. Before it was just potential consciousness and it's immersed entirely. Why do we do it that way? Because the individuated unit of consciousness doesn't want to be immersed. The individual unit of consciousness is the collector. It may have two or three of these incarnations going at once. It wants to collect all the data. Besides, it's getting the data and it's, it's looking at all the data in whole. It's trying to see if some of what it learns here will inform some of what it learned there to get a better see. It's looking at the whole thing. And by looking at the whole thing, it can find lessons and learning that it won't find by just looking at, you know, one individual one. It can see the bigger picture of these lives. So all of that data from its free will awareness unit feeds back up to the individuated unit of consciousness, who is the accumulator, the synthesizer, the looking at it from the big picture and internalizing it and growing up. Okay, so the next time it does a free will awareness unit, it goes out with a little higher level of potential. You see? But it still starts from scratch. So that little free will awareness unit is immersed. And that's a different kind of arrangement than in World of Warcraft. In World of Warcraft, we're sitting here watching our elf run around on the World of Warcraft map in the World of Warcraft world. But we're not immersed. We get up and take a break, go to the refrigerator, make a sandwich, you know, go outside and play or something. Then we come back and sit down and resume the game. We're not immersed in it. 
Now, some kids almost get immersed in it. They get into that thing and they don't eat. They don't do anything. They just play. They're in it. And they don't know anything else that's going around. And they may be immersed for a while, maybe for a few hours. But they're not really totally immersed. They're not living and breathing it 24-7. That's total immersion. And that's what you need in order to grow in this thing. You can't say, oh, well, I'm kind of having a hard time over here in this physical reality. And then just take a break from that. And when you take a break, your character, like the World of War, they just stand there and wait for you to come back, you know, and they wobble a little bit. They kind of, like this, you know, they wobble around while you uh, go make a sandwich, and then you come back, you play them again. That, uh, you know, it doesn't work here, because this is a real tight rule set. It has to be continuous play. It has to be immersion. And the individual at the unit of consciousness isn't up for immersion. It's up for collection, synthesis, and trying to grow from it. So that's the way it is. So now in this free will awareness unit, which is what I call little C consciousness, that's the consciousness that's in our head. That's the little C consciousness that's immersed now in this game. When that's done, when that avatar dies, that free will awareness unit is done. It's gone. Disintegrated. Don't use that anymore, you see. But the history of it, the data of everything it thought, everything it felt, everything in this database of consciousness, everything that went through that consciousness, all the feelings, all the sensations, everything from before it was born till its death is all in the past database. So that's there. But this particular free will awareness unit is just gone. You know, that's the way it is. It's, it's done its thing, played its part, it dies, and now that individuated unit of consciousness can go have another one, another free will awareness unit, or two of them if it wants, to play them in this game at a little higher level now because it learned from that last one. So that's the way it works. And let me caution you again, this is not, don't take it literally. These are metaphors, they're functional metaphors. We know consciousness has these functions because we see it. I've experienced it in the larger consciousness system. I experience it here. Everybody experiences, we are immersed here. Okay? We also are connected to something larger because evolution takes time. Evolution doesn't happen in one step. You don't start out, I'm a baby, and now, wow, I'm an adult, you know. An hour later, I turn into an adult. It doesn't work that way. You have to grow through all those stages. Becoming love is not a simple thing that you just do one shot. It's something you have to accumulate over a whole lot of experience. So we need that accumulator function. The thing that takes all the data in and assesses it, does the synthesis and learns and grows from it. And then you need that, that subset that's immersed and just has the experience, makes the choices. So what the consciousness is doing is making all the choices for the avatar. The avatar doesn't do anything that the consciousness doesn't make the choice for. The avatar is just like the elf. It's just a computation out of a computer. The avatar doesn't have a brain. The avatar doesn't have a physical body. The avatar doesn't have a consciousness of its own. The consciousness, the free will awareness unit, is the consciousness and the rest of it is just a virtual reality data generated in a computer. See? But that, that free will awareness unit that gets born starts learning how to interpret the data stream. It gets a data stream and it has to figure out how to interpret that data. It's, it, it's not immediately clear how to interpret any of the data. It has to learn, you know? What's what? Who's who? Light from dark, mom from dad, you know, apple from peach, you know, it, it learns all this stuff as it experiences it. So it begins to build its own experience here. And you that's see. how it, that's how it has to go. So that may make it a little more understandable looking at this functional model. Now these things are metaphors. We make these up so that we can talk about these functions. Because understanding the functions help you understand the process that consciousness has to go through. So we give them names, individual unit of consciousness, free will awareness unit, and we say what the function of each of these is and how that works. So there's a couple of things to 
to get here, and one of them is that the virtual, rea the virtual reality's rules of interaction creates the context that enables the free will choice and its consequences to exist within a consistent framework called a reality frame. Okay, and virtual realities are fundamental to consciousness, just as time and free will are fundamental to consciousness. Okay, you can't have consciousness, a full consciousness, not just a proto-conscious or a, or a primordial consciousness, but a, a real full-blown consciousness with a finite decision space. You can't have consciousness, as we think of it, a communicating, interacting consciousness until you have at least a virtual reality big enough to communicate with, you see. Otherwise, you just have awareness. And that awareness is maybe just aware, aware of this state and that, and it's been able to change that, but that's it. See, it's very limited. We think of consciousness as this interactive thing that's taking in data and passing out data, and that doesn't really happen until you have a VR where it can communicate. So we have consciousness, we have free will, and we have a virtual reality. Okay, well, I guess as you say, we have awareness, free will, and virtual reality. Those together really enable the kind of consciousness that we think of when we think of consciousness. So that's, that's a, kind of an interesting thing. Consciousness requires all of those because without free will, there's no choice. Without choice, you know, there's, there's no consciousness. There's no growth. What are you conscious of if you don't have any choice? You know, there, there's nothing for consciousness to do. There's no way to express it if there's no choice then it's a deterministic thing that just stays and never changes. It doesn't grow, it doesn't become, it doesn't have any point. If it doesn't grow, it doesn't become, it doesn't do anything, well, it's superfluous, it doesn't have any point. So evolution does not create things that have no point. Evolution creates things that work. So that's the, that's the idea, you need time, you need virtual reality, you need awareness. If you have all those, then you get consciousness, and we kind of show that all that can just evolve, starting with a little good luck and randomness, and then after that, it's not so random because you know our evolution isn't entirely random because we part of a feedback in our larger uh, uh, that our larger conscious system has given us in this virtual reality is intent modifies future probability. That's a feedback for us. That way we create a world that reflects ourselves, which is feedback, is what we are and what we need to be. So that's part of the feedback process. Okay, so that's, that's a, an important connection there with us, that we create, in a lot of ways, we create our own reality. Our reality reflects us the way we are, the way we truly are, not the way we'd like to be or the way we think we are, but what we see out there is, is really the way we are. Not a pretty picture right now, but uh, <laughs> the picture's the picture's getting better. So that's the, we need time. There is no consciousness as we understand it without time. There is no consciousness we understand it without free will. Because the whole thing won't work without those, without those components. I think that was a very um, elegant and simple yeah. explanation of a very complex thing. Um, your example of the original awareness cell and then your example of a biological cell and how they were formed. Is that, is that the fractal pattern that you sometimes speak of Well, sure, that's the fractal pattern. Because this thing, the fractal, you know, we talk about a geometric fractal where you have a, a, a shape. A geometric, it's called a geometric fractal. So you have some geometry, which is basically an equation. Equation could be, you know, a shape, but a shape's in an equation. And then what happens is you, you keep repeating that equation that, that shape on itself, keep adding it to itself. Like you have a triangle, then you put a bunch of smaller triangles on the edge of each of your triangle. And then you can put even smaller triangles on the edges of all of those triangles. And now you may have a bigger triangle form from all of the things. And anyway, so you just keep adding triangles to triangles to triangles at different sizes, different scales, and you can build up these most amazing fractal geometry things. They look like clouds and mountains and flowers and all sorts of stuff come out of these simple equations just repeated over and over again and keep building on themselves. 
Well, a, a process fractal, and I call it a consciousness evolution process fractal, because consciousness is the medium and evolution is the process. So what happens is you have a thing capable of evolving and the process is evolution. So it evolves and you take the state that it evolves to. So it's at A, it evolves to B. Then you take B, put it back into the evolution. You see the output gets fed back into the input. And then it evolves some more and the output gets fed back into the input. It evolves some more and the output gets fed back to the input. So it keeps evolving like that. That makes a process fractal. We're not repeating a geometric equation of geometric shape, we're repeating a process called evolution. So as this process just keeps, you know, the, the output keeps feeding into the input and we keep changing it, we end up with our universe, our planet, and us. So it's just the nature of evolution that these things are similar. The same processes that created the larger consciousness system the same processes that are creating, you know, the, the single cell and, and uh, everything that came out of that. It's, it's all very similar processes that just chug on different inputs and outputs. So now you take that biological cell and you start taking the output of that and putting back the input. You keep evolving and evolving and evolving it and you end up with all the creatures and all the plants and everything that there, there is and that evolves out of, out of that. Various permutations and combinations and possibilities of everything that could happen and they all kind of evolve out of this machine and as they evolve their own way well the output gets put back into the input and they keep you know it keeps chugging on so yes they're very similar so we see the similarity between them because that's just the nature of evolution evolution uh, always produces like i said in the beginning talking about uh, um, these hard problems. Evolution produces efficient solutions within the probability space. This is a probabilistic, not a deterministic simulation. So what's possible? Well, there's a lot of things that are possible. What's the probability that you come out this way, this way, this way, or this way? You have probabilities for all the possibilities. If there's a thousand possibilities, then there's a thousand probabilities for each one of those possibilities. Well, when you get to a point that something happens and it comes into this reality, a random draw, you see, of the probability of, the possi of a given possibility, that's what you get. So every once in a while, you get some weird stuff out on the end of the probability distribution. Most of the time, you get stuff in the middle of the probability distribution. And that's just the way it works. So we have a, a huge diversity because it's, it's a probabilistic reality that it takes all the possibilities and there's some probability of each one of those happening. Now the stuff that's really, really weird, the probability may be very, very low, but you have a system that keeps drawing these things out for a long enough time, you get things that are very diverse, which is what we see. And in consciousness, it works the same way. If you have ever uh, traveled around in a larger consciousness system, you know it's very diverse for the same reason. That's why there's all these parallels. It's because that's just the way evolution and consciousness works. You mentioned the free will awareness unit as being a subset of the individuated unit of consciousness, mm -hmm. which is a subset of the larger consciousness system. The free will awareness unit comes in without any baggage. Now, for some of my friends who are into the reincarnation theory, they would say coming in without any baggage is not always true. Some mm -hmm. phobias, some recollections and things it's like true. that can come in. This is not the general rule, but well, they, it can, they can come in. They can, and, and the reason they come in is because that represents the being level of their individuated unit of consciousness. If they're, in, I say, it, it takes the, the fundamentals, the essence out of that individuated unit of consciousness, and that's what transfers. And if that, if that in, individual unit of consciousness has this, this, you know, fear of snakes or something, you know, that's, that's in it at the being level. That's just the way it is. It's got all that at the being level. That goes in. 
intellectual part doesn't go in, but a, a, an accurate description of that entity, which includes all of its fears, all of its love, all of its everything is at the being level. So the whole being level with all its warts and all of its you know, wonders, the potential for that all goes in to this free will awareness unit. But that free will awareness unit has no memory because it's not attached to any, you know, it's just potential. No, so it doesn't, no, know, it doesn't know why it exactly. has these. It just has them. Now okay. it starts getting plugged in to the data stream that defines a virtual reality game here, you know, PMR. It gets plugged into that data stream and it starts experiencing. It's got all this stuff in it as its potential. You see, that's what I mean. You can come with a high potential or low potential. So if your potential is lower, you're going to come in with more fear, with more problems, with more obsessions. Who knows what it is that you get. They won't be necessarily particular obsessions. It may not be an obsession of snakes or spiders. It may just be a proclivity to be fearful of scary things. Very fearful of scary things. Now, once this... this uh, Free will awareness unit gets experience, it may pick a different scary thing to express that in, but it comes in with that. So it may not really, you know, this one was afraid of spiders, this one may come in and be afraid of elephants or afraid of, of shadows or afraid of aliens or afraid of snakes or something else. It won't necessarily have to be the same because the detailed data isn't, but all the fundamentals of it, the essence of it is the same. So it has this proclivity to to be in a particular way, to be fearful, say. That would come because its, it's IUOC was very fearful. Now, a more highly evolved entity doesn't have that much fear. And the free will awareness unit doesn't have that much potential for fear. Doesn't mean that it can't develop it on its own. Free will awareness units don't have to always evolve. They can de-evolve too. But it doesn't, it has a better start. So whatever's in that being level of the, of the individuated unit of consciousness, that's what the free will awareness unit starts with, fear and all. So wouldn't it be a good thing to try to uncover that source and try to understand it and get rid of it so that the being mm -hmm. level has less of that? Yes, absolutely. Because what happens is this free will awareness unit overcomes that fear well, then it's basically upgrading its parent. You see, it's having experiences where it had that fear, but it over, you know, it overcomes the fear. It puts the fear behind it. Okay, well, that's basically growth of this free will awareness unit. It's learning to put that fear behind it because it's just a piece. It's the it's a it's a piece of the free will awareness unit. So the free will awareness unit is going to evolve as its pieces evolve because it's. You know, those pieces are a part of it. So that's the way it works. This, in other words, this little free will awareness unit is making decisions, but it is a, it's been birthed out of this individual unit of consciousness and it carries the same kind of potential. But as this grows up, the whole grows up. And it's not like that free will awareness unit just keeps all of its information to itself until it dies and then there's a big upload to the, to the individual unit of consciousness, that information is going back to the individual unit of consciousness all the time. And as it grows up, so does the parent grow up. So that's the point. But yes, you start with that being level quality, be that good or be that bad. And that's what you begin with. It's not that important what you begin with as it is as how well you do with it. You know, it's not the cards you're dealt, it's how you play them. You know, is the thing. So this free will awareness unit may have been dealt some pretty sorry cards because its parent was pretty sorry. But if it improves that a whole lot, well, the next time that free will awareness unit will be at a higher level. You see, so that's, that's how the you thing. finish that matters. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's how you finish that matters. It's a good slogan. I've heard that somewhere before. Somewhere familiar. That's, yes. Uh, exactly. It's what you do with it. It's not necessarily where you start, but what you do with it. How do, you, how do you improve it? It's growing up is the thing. It's not a matter of, of you have to grow up to this point or ring this bell or you know pass go and get $200. It's just 
make some progress. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a very interesting and very clear and clarifying way to describe how consciousness um, and the succession from the individuated unit of consciousness to the, the free avatar. Will, yeah, free will awareness unit. How that yeah. works. It's and remember, a metaphor. Yes, of course. A functional model yes. of how these things work. But it does help us talk about them. Yes. See, without the, without the metaphors, we can't talk about them. We can only talk about them in terms of, of metaphors. Well, you, you do a particularly good job because you have, I think, the biggest picture of how reality works. And I think this should be very helpful to everyone. Well, I hope so. That's why we do this, isn't it, Valerie? <laughs> this, this is yeah. one of my favorites. <laughs> this yeah. and, and the previous. Thank you very much. Okay.